All right, well, uh, chapter one of Genesis, of course, is a bit of an overview. It's a generalization. Chapter two becomes a little more detailed of how mankind came to be. Uh, Chapter one goes through the six days of creation. Chapter two begins with the seventh day. Thus, the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished, meaning were created. And that's what the first six days of creation were about in chapter one. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on uh, the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Uh, We don't want to get the impression at all that God was tired and needed a break. Um, His creative power was not drained. There was no strain at all in what he had to do. What God is doing for us is actually showing or setting a pattern, establishing a right way of thinking for mankind. And part of that is you don't have to work every day of the week. In fact, it's important to take a break. It's really something as simple as that. And so thus, God created the Sabbath rest. Now, I want to make sure that you understand something about the Sabbath rest, something that we find in the New Testament, but it's something, the principle that God is laying out for us. And that is that for the believer, there is a rest that is available. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us about that. And uh, uh, in verse uh, 9 of Hebrews chapter 4, it says, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. And the word rest is the same word as Sabbath. It's a Sabbath rest, we call it. There is this rest that is available for God's people. For he who has entered God's rest has himself also ceased from his own works as God did from his. Now, this is an important um, connection, this New Testament verse from Hebrews 4, with this Old Testament passage here in chapter 2 of Genesis. The importance here is that our rest is not about doing nothing or sitting and doing nothing. It's about entering a place of peace with God. And as we enter this place of peace with God, then life is, in a sense, more of a Sabbath rest. We can have the peace of God in everything that we do. That's not to take away from the physical uh, benefits of taking some time to relax, turning off the mind a little bit, sh- shutting down, taking a drive in the country. Reading the Bible is a way that I find is a good way to find rest, to just take time in the morning. And you know, it's weird that you get up early in the morning and you think you're going to be tired, but you get up early in the morning and spend time with the Lord. It's time well spent. And that's an important part of finding rest with God. Not as much about the working part, but just finding that peace with God. And that's, for the believer, that's the way we should approach it. Sabbath for us is an everyday event. And when God rests here, he is setting a pattern, setting an example for us. God didn't need the rest. We need the rest. And so he does so. Verse 3, in verse 3 it says, Then God blessed the seventh day, that's the Sabbath day, he sanctified it or set it apart. And thus, by doing this, he now establishes this day as a day of worship. Uh, Now, of course, some do get legalistic about this day. We have the seventh day Christians, and they uh, believe that this seventh day is something that we're supposed to honor in a very traditional, very strict, and very um, uh, almost a religious way. I don't want to have to say it that way. Like I said, our Sabbath rest is every day, and our Sabbath with the Lord is every day. But there is a good practice, a good uh, pattern to be set as God made the day holy. The word sanctified not only means set apart, but we also have the word holy that comes from that root word. And so it is a holy day, a day that we are supposed to honor the Lord with. And so it's a good habit for us to get into. Uh, Don't get religious about it. Don't get legalistic about it. So long as you have a spiritual life, 
If you will develop a spiritual life, then honestly, every day is a Sabbath day for you. And that's the idea. That's where we come from. That's the position I come from anyway, that every day for me is a time that I can spend with the Lord. Sundays and Wednesday nights are special days for me because I get to spend them not only with the Lord, but with you, the brothers and sisters in the faith. So that's the joy of it. We've established these days that we can come together. You know, you hear people say this all the time, well, you don't have to go to church. Well, I suppose it's true that you don't have to, but you really should. And you're missing out if you don't. There's so much that you can benefit by being in fellowship, and the fellowship benefits when you're there. And so all of it is important, and we must not... um, Uh, 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 shirk that duty to be present in the body of Christ. As Hebrews also said that we are not to forsake the assembling together of the saints. That's like the habit of some it's. It's it's not a good habit to get into to avoid fellowship with brothers and sisters, but quite the opposite is true. If you're not in fellowship, one of the things that can happen is that you can get off doctrinally, but you'll never know it. You will go off doctrinally, but in your mind you'll believe you are absolutely right. In fact, usually those who stay out of fellowship regularly usually come up with their own religion. They just don't realize that's what they're doing. They believe they're the only ones practicing the right religion, and then they start to come up with the excuse of, well, that's why I don't go to church, because they're all a bunch of hypocrites, or that's why I don't go to church, because they're doing it wrong. And so they won't be a part of the Christian fellowship, where it's possible they may have some good ideas to help the Christian church start doing it right. But uh, uh, I think when someone does that, it's usually sort of the tail wagging the dog. They've already gotten themselves deep into a problem of non-fellowship, and they tried to look for ways to justify it. God established Christian fellowship. He wants brothers and sisters to be together. One of the things about the, the uh, letter to, that John writes, in the, the first letter of John in the New Testament, is the love for the brethren. John said, you have to have that. You have to have a love for the brethren, or basically what he basically says is that the truth of God is not in you if you don't love being with the brethren. You can boast about how right you are, but if you don't love the brethren, you got a problem in your spiritual life. That's what the message of the epistle of John, first epistle of John, uh, brings about. So keep that in mind as God blessed this day, he sanctified it, set it apart, and he wants us to do the same. Because in this day is the day that God set that pattern of ceasing from his work just as he asks us to do in the New Testament. Now, this is the history of the heavens and the earth. This is the history. Uh, how do we know it's the history? Where does it come from? Where, why do we uh, want to trust it? And before we go too far, let me remind you the book of Genesis, the Bible, in fact, is not a history book. It, I mean, sorry, it's not a science book. It is a history book, but not a science book. In other words, the Bible doesn't try to solve uh, all of the mysteries of the universe or reveal. It doesn't try to reveal all the mysteries of the universe. Uh, so it's not a science book, nor does it contradict science. Typically, science might try to contradict the Bible. It's usually the other way around. But over time, over and over again, the Bible has proven itself to be, in fact, accurate, though it doesn't set itself up to be a science book. This is, however, the way things happen. That's the idea of of the history of the creation of the heavens and the earth. It is the history of it. This is how the things came about. The word history is used many times in this book of Genesis, and the word is is often translated into the term genealogy. You see that term a lot. Genealogy, history, same Hebrew word here. And so when we see this, it's really the genealogy or the way things, the lineup of how things came to be. As much as possible, as you know, the creation of the universe had to be an extremely complex thing. We have it in just 31 verses. 
that's given to us as if it was nothing. Uh, it, it, we read through it in just a few moments, and we can say, there, God created the heavens and the earth. And we're supposed to believe that. We're expected to believe it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We're expected to believe that. And we believe it because, well, this is what God has given to us to understand. And uh, we can, if you're a Christian scientist, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, you're going to look at the scientific evidence and you're going to say, oh, yes, there is the fingerprint of God. If you're a non-believer, you're going to look at the scientific evidence and say, wow, isn't evolution amazing? So you, it's possible to look at the same evidence and come to different conclusions depending on really the condition of your spiritual life, your heart. And so if you believe what this history is, well, well then you, you will have a kind of a head start on things. And those who are wise in the academic world, they start from this. They start from, in the beginning, God. They start from, this is the history. Okay, that's what I believe. Now let me set out to go and prove that. Let me go set out to discover that. And that's where Christian scientists have a bit of an edge as they go out into the world to discover what God has done. And they, almost, most likely, more, like, more times than not, will come back with the discoveries of the evidence of what God has done. Now, the history is something that we have. Obviously, nobody was there. No human being was there to record the history. So the question comes up then, well, where did we get the history? Who is the authority on this? Who is the historian that records this stuff? Well, we believe Moses is the author of Genesis, but Moses comes hundreds of years after this event of creation. So how does he know this? How does he come to know it? Well, let me just talk about Moses just for a second. Moses, of course, spent days with God up on the mountaintop. It's highly possible that when God was giving Moses the law, they had other conversations. Moses had a relationship with God where they spoke face to face, it tells us, in Scripture, they had conversations. I imagine one of the think about it. You're standing face to face with God. What are you going to ask Him? What is the purpose of life? How did we come to be? What is this all about? Well, sit down, Moses. Pull up a stone. Let me tell you how we all how you all came about, and I'll tell you the story. It's possible. That's how the story of Genesis came to be. That He recorded exactly as God told Him. It happened because of the conversations that Moses would have with, with God. Now, I don't have that. In fact, I don't have it that it says it. It doesn't say that in the Bible. But I imagine that's how we could have the history of the creation. It is also possible, as we're going to see in this chapter, that this man, Adam, was actually quite brilliant. It's very possible that by the time Adam walked the earth, just the short time, his ability to communicate with God, to talk with God, we're going to see he names all the animals, so he was a bit of a, of a, a biologist, a botanist. He knew all the plants. He knew everything. He was able to identify them and point them out. And with that, it's highly possible he might have written some things down even at this early time. He could have jotted some things on. God could have helped him, could have taught him how to do that. Or it may be possible, as is often the case in the ancient world, that stories get passed on as tale telling. They're telling tales, they're telling stories. Sitting around the campfire, and little uh, you know, Cain or little um, Abel comes up to Daddy and says, Dad, where did we all come from? Let me tell you the story about God and how he created the earth. And he tells the story to his children, and they tell it to their children. And then it comes all the way down to Moses, who says, are we verifying all of this? Yes, it is verified. Let me write it down before we forget. So it's possible, obviously, that Moses had a part in it. But how the history came to be, we're not sure, other than we know here in this book we call the Bible and believe it to be the Word of God. This is the history of the heavens and the earth. And I have no authority to challenge that. And I don't intend to. So I believe this to be the history on the Word of God. And when they were created, so this is what we're talking about. And in the day that the Lord God 
made the heaven and made the earth and the heavens. Don't pass over it. Here we have the first mention of Yahweh. That word in the English is Lord. It doesn't say Lord in the Hebrew Bible. It says Yahweh, or some refer to it as Jehovah. The word God is Elohim. So this is the first combination of a name, the names of God. Up till now, it was only Elohim, Elohim, Elohim. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Here is the first mention of the actual name of Elohim, Yahweh Elohim. And so Yahweh Elohim made the earth and the heavens before any plant of the field was on the earth and before any herb of the field was grown. For Yahweh Elohim had not caused it to rain on the earth. There was no man to till the ground. So in the days of creation, we know as the way it was prepared, the way it came into being, the plants uh, were not created first, but the plants were created before mankind. A couple of days had to pass before Adam came onto the scene, and so there was no one to tend it. The way God created it, this verse sort of lends a little um, uh, credibility to the idea of some sort of a, 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 a barrier around the earth, a cloud layer, a marine layer as we might refer to it in our uh, world, uh, but it created this canopy effect, which means that the earth may have been extra warm. It may have been a little more uh, uh, tropical around the earth. There probably would have not been any weather patterns because there was no rain. That's what it says here. So there were no weather, weather patterns. And so it was needed to be uh, watered by a mist, as verse 6 tells us, that a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So uh, fog could be a mist, but it, it, it comes up. That's how the plants were watered. There was no one to tend it, and so God watered them through the, the mist that he created. Now, notice in verse 5, before any plant of the field was on the earth, and before any herb of the field, before creation... God was there. And in the New Testament tells us that in a couple of places, in particular in Colossians, where he, uh, it, God existed before anything, is what the Scripture tells us. And so before any of that, our God was there. And so if we believe this to be his word, well, he was there, so he's the eyewitness. He is the historian that is giving us these details. Verse 7, and the Lord God, that's uh, Yahweh Elohim once again, formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, here is the creation of man. This is sort of the, the backtracking now. Chapter 1, he says that he created man and he put him in his garden and gave him uh, the permission to tend it. Well, here is the details of how man came to be. He, God, formed. That word formed, remember we talked about different words for create. There is the word bara in the very first verse in the beginning. God bara the heavens and the earth. He spoke the word, he, and it appeared. It was created out of nothing. And then we use the word asa. Asa meant that there was something there that he kind of shaped and formed. This is the word yatsar. Yatsar is also this word that is taking something and making something with it. More specific, he molded it. That's what it's talking about. He molded man from the dust of of the ground. It's fascinating to me that he talks about that. What from the ground did he use? The word dust in the Hebrew is a word that literally means the clay or the mud or the elements of the ground. And it, he, he took the elements from the earth, the elements from the ground, and with that put the right combinations of it together and created, formed, molded a man from it. In the shape of a man, two arms, two legs, a head, a torso, all of this, he, he said, that is going to be man. It's odd, or interesting, I should say, that 
Scientists have actually taken the human body and break, broken it down into its elements. And they are the exact elements of dirt. <laughs> so you're probably worth about 28 cents just in dirt. You have the exact elements as the earth. And uh, that is no, uh, uh, again, the Bible's not a science book, but certainly you see the science in it and you say, wow, that's scientific. Now, this is something secular, secular scientists understand. They know that, that we, our human bodies, have the same elements as the ground, different uh, ratios, different percentages, but nonetheless, we're still uh, from the earth. And so God, this is a confirmation of what God did. He took us from the dust of the ground, but that isn't what made us living. Uh, we, I'm sure, have tried that as kids. You take a little water, you put it in the dirt, and you make something, but it's not going to get up and walk for you. It's God who, it says here, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man then became this living creature, this living being. The literal Hebrew is a living soul. Uh, the debate is, uh, did man uh, suddenly develop a soul, or is man actually a soul? In other words, does he have a soul and his body, or is he the soul that lives in his body? And of course, I think we are the soul that we happen to live in these bodies, and that's just the way they, that we are. And you think of this idea of what happened here. God took this inanimate soil sample. He breathed a breath of life. The breath of God brought life into the dust and it became alive. It became a living thing. The heart that wasn't there until God made it there, and it wasn't beating until God breathed in the nostrils of Adam, and then it began to start beating. And now it's this living soul, this living being, this living creature, if you will. The creation has begun. Now we get to realize that as time goes on and Chapter 3 comes in, and, and this living spiritual being, at this point he's everything that man was meant to be. He's alive. He's alive in every way. He's in the presence of God with a relationship to God. That's a spiritual being now. He's also then the soul, the part of him that has the, the ability to think, the ability to feel, the ability to choose and make decisions for himself. The, the mind, the heart, and the, and the will are all working in sync and following after the things of God. And then came sin. And all of that got overturned and upset. And now all that spiritual life is sort of dead and put to the side. But we go into the New Testament, and Jesus comes onto the scene, and he begins talking about the kingdom of God is among you. The kingdom of God is with you. I am here with you. I have come to give you life, and that more abundantly. I want to give you life. Anyone who comes to me has life. And he's talking about life and life and life and life. And he gets into John chapter 20, and there he urges his disciples received the Holy Spirit, and he breathed on them. He breathed on them. The first time God breathed, we see life. They were, I want to say, uh, vived. Vived. Vived, the root word for revive, is actually vivere. It's a root that means to live, to, to come to life. And so when God breathed the first time, he came to life. But when man sinned, he died spiritually. Jesus, or God said, in the day you eat of it, you will die. Well, then we get into the New Testament. And that word, that word breathe, and man became again another living being, spiritual being. He was then revived. We always talk about revival. Revival implies that you were once alive and now you're coming back to life. To revive, that's the idea, to revivere, if you will. Again, to come to life. Again, to come to life. We have a New Testament term for that, born again. 
That's what Jesus was doing with these brothers there at that, that resurrection scene. After he breathed on them, he said, I want you to be born again. I want you to come alive. And that's, of course, what happened. And so this beautiful picture, by the way, the, the, remember the Septuagint? The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. The Old Testament written in Hebrew and Aramaic. New Testament written in Greek. This Old Testament written in Greek is known as the Septuagint. Well, in the Septuagint, this verse, verse 7, that word uh, uh, living became a living being or a, to breathe, that word breathe, is the same Greek word as what is in John chapter 20, where Jesus breathed on them as well. The same sort of a, a principle is applying. So Jesus brought in the new creation. If any man is in Christ, he now is a new creation, this revived being, the revived soul. And I hope that you have a revived soul, meaning that you're born again. If not, you need to be. Jesus said you must be born again. Verse 8, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there uh, he put the man whom he had formed. This is, of course, we call the Garden of Eden. And the Garden of Eden was an actual place. It was a place that was designed for Adam and ultimately for Eve and really for all men uh, should they have survived that first incident of sin in chapter 3. But they did not. And so this is sort of what God had replaced as we see it in the book of Revelation, everything's going to go back to this one day. But for now, God has created this. He's created a garden. He put it in this place called Eden. Uh, and out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And that's the point of the garden. It's a useful place. It's a place every tree was to grow so that it would sustain life for those occupants of the garden. And so it says that the tree of life was there, was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. Let me simplify that for you. The tree of life you can call the tree of salvation, because those who partake of the tree of life will enjoy eternal life. We know that the tree of life will reappear. I mean, it goes away, of course, after Genesis 3. But in Revelation, we see in chapter 22, the tree of life reappears. In fact, the tree of life is abundant in the new uh, heaven and, and the new Jerusalem. It is all over the place that we would be able to eat the tree of life the fruit of the tree of life, every month a new fruit, 12 different fruits coming, all in their season, and they're ours to enjoy. Eat it all, eat up, eat up, eat up. Tree of life, eternally, eternal life. That's the idea, the tree of salvation. The tree of knowledge and good and evil, you might call the tree of temptation. This is the one that God simply said, don't touch this one. If you touch that one, you will die. Don't touch this tree. Thus, it gives now Adam and Eve a choice. Prior to this, there's no choice. Eat all you want. Eat all you want. It's all yours. It's all yours. The only choice is, what are we having for dinner tonight? And that's the only choice they would have had. But in this particular case, God would say, do not touch that tree. Thus, now a temptation has been established. A temptation to say, yes, I will eat it, or no, I will not eat it in obedience to God's command. This is the knowledge of good and evil. It's there. It's not necessarily a tree that's good or evil. It's just a tree that God said, don't touch it. And unfortunately, it was enough to create the temptation. Now, a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon, the, uh, it is the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Then there's Bedellum and Onyx stone that are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is 
the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hidekel. Hidekel is actually the Tigris River. It is the one which goes toward the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. Now, we're familiar with two of them. The other two we are not familiar with. We believe the reason for that is because it was destroyed or the patterns of their water flow was changed. As I mentioned, Eden was an actual place. It's a place that is no doubt centered right around the region of Iraq. This place where the river Eden, uh, the river uh, began uh, to flow through Eden was probably up north in the area of Turkey. And so this river flew, uh, flow, flew, flow, flowed in, through into the Garden of Eden, and after it broke, came out of the Garden of Eden, it broke into four rivers. Now, this is a place that many believe or call, they believe it was in the area of Mesopotamia. Now, the interesting thing is the word Mesopotamia actually means place between rivers, between the rivers. And so here is this, this uh, area that we see. What changed the weather pattern or the flow of the rivers was probably the flood, the catastrophe of the global flood. Everything, topography, all the geography of the land, all was, was distorted or changed and altered. And so four rivers during the time of uh, the garden existence, during the time of man in the garden, afterward all of that changed and uh, became uh, uh, destroyed, if you will by the flood in some way. Actual rivers. Is this the actual Tigris River and Euphrates River, the ones that we know of today? We're not sure. It's possible that Noah, after the flood, saw these two rivers and decided to give them familiar names, and that's how he named them. We're not, we're not sure, but all we know is this was an actual place, and uh, God... Uh, had it destroyed for good reason. Then the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden in order to tend and to keep it. It's interesting that the Garden of Eden was no paradise, it was a workshop. This is where Adam was required to tend the, the, the soil, to tend the trees, maybe to trim them, prune them, prune them. Uh, but he had a job to do and work was required. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of temptation, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. There will be a consequence for your disobedience. Some would make uh, I guess a, a big deal about the tree, like the tree in itself had some magical powers or some sort of uh, power that it would do something to you, like open your eyes or something and they would see something. It's very possible that it was a tree that God said, I'd rather you, rather you didn't have that. Obviously, if it was dangerous, God could have removed the tree. He could have taken it out of the garden, but he did not. He put it in the garden he created the garden, so he planted it there, and he left it there, and he pointed it out to Adam. This tree here, you see this tree? I don't want you to eat at that fruit. Well, why not? I, I believe it's as simple as because God said so. I don't know that there was a magical fruit. I don't know if it does anything. I don't know if it had an effect on them, but when they ate it, there was a consequence. Sin entered, entered the world, and sin changed everything. Sin is uh, rebellion against God. Sin is, is disobedience to God. Sin is doing something that does not please the Lord. And so when God said, do not eat of that tree, and they ate of that tree, it was in direct violation to the command of God. Thus the tree was left there, because God wants us, to obey him by choice, not out of the fear of the consequence, but rather because God said so. It's such 
a difficult but very simple principle for us to understand. If we will just do as God says, life will be so much easier. Obey Him, and life will have better consequences rather than bad consequences. Do as God says. That's all. He doesn't need to think about, well, let's see, how do I get around these consequences? That's what we do. We think we can get around the consequences. We think we can, we can uh, maybe you know, have lesser consequences, or we just don't believe that there will be consequences. And so we live the way we want to live and not take into account the way God wants us to live. That's not the way the children of God are to behave. We have to live according to God's ways. Like I said, whether this tree had any magical stuff to it, I don't want to say magical, it's the wrong word, but if it had any, any quality in, in the fruit itself, that if you ate it, something happened inside of you. I think, I think it may have been part of the temptation. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Wouldn't it be funny if it was just an apple tree? You know, we think it is. We say it's an apple. It's, we don't know what kind of fruit it was. But what if it was something as simple as that? It's just an apple. And when they bit into it, they went, nothing. I don't get anything from this fruit. I don't know what the big deal. I don't know why he told us to stay away from this thing. There's nothing. It's just it's nothing even the, You know, apple's not one of my favorite fruits, but I mean, it'd be good to feed the cows with, I suppose. You know, that's, I don't know what they were thinking. But the bottom line is they disobeyed. That's where the consequence came from. And the Lord God said, It is not good for that man should be alone. And remember how chapter 1 ended, that God uh, saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And throughout he said, it was good. He, God saw what he made and it was good, and it was good. In the last verse of 31 there, it was very good. And now... He said, found something that's not good. Man is alone. All of these animals here, but man is alone. And so it's not good that man should be alone. So I will make him a helper comparable to him. Purpose, purposeful partnership. That's what God was looking for in this new creation of a new being, a new, a new type of being. Same species, but a different a different version of it. I'm going to make him a helper. Why? Because it's not good for man to be alone. It's just not good. In uh, Ecclesi uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, it's a passage, I use both of these verses in weddings quite often. In chapter 4 of Ecclesiastes in verse 9, two are better than one. What a beautiful understanding of what God was talking about in Genesis 2. It's not good for man to be alone. Therefore, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will help his companion. That's the idea of a marriage is companionship. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And here's this clincher, it's sort of a, an obvious discussion of God. It says, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Throughout the passage, it's two, 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 two. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. It's talking about a braid, the braiding together of three members, and you put it together, and it creates an unbreakable bond. That's the idea of the marriage. The man, the woman, and God intertwined around them, doing things God's way, living according to God's plan, and there's going to be an unbreakable bond there. That's the, the beauty of a marriage. So it's not good that man should be alone. We've got to make, make him a helper. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field. There's that word again, yatsar, to take something that was, and um, uh, put, put and, and formed the beast of the field. That's he's putting it. I'm going to get to a different word. You'll see what I mean. He takes these beasts. Now all the animals were sort of created from the earth, 
from the same sort of things. We know we're all the same. And if you think about it, even man was made of the earth and we're made from the dust of the earth. Prior to the fall, we were vegetarians. What does that create? Compost. We ate compost. That's because we are dirt. And you throw compost into the dirt, mix it up a little bit, it becomes more dirt. We needed that to sustain life. That's how we were. After the fall, of course, everything changed. But here is now God giving us the concept, I took all of the cre creation and brought them together. And he brought them to Adam to see what he, could call, he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. A little bit of a troublesome point here, for me at least. Uh, how long did that take? How long did this take? If you read the, this text in context, the whole, th the whole chapter, you get the impression that Adam and Eve were created on the same day. But if you kind of get the gist of this, this took some time, I imagine. I, I don't know how you're going to parade all of the animal species in the animal kingdom, parade them in front of Adam so that he can say, hmm, that guy with the long neck, I think I'm going to call him a gorilla. No, no, no not gorilla. Uh, giraffe. And he starts naming them. Of course, he probably didn't give them English names, uh, nor did he give them Latin names. But <laughs> like so much of the animal kingdom. But there are these, these uh, uh, the things that go in my head anyway that trouble me. How long did this take? And uh, so he named all of these animals. And Adam, so Adam gave names to all cattle, the birds of the air, every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Now, why did God do it that way? It's uh, possible, as God allowed it, that he was multitasking. We're going to name the animals, and we're going to find a suitable helper <laughs> for Adam at the same time, which wasn't the case. God knew that. So it was less for God, more for Adam. So that Adam would come to realize, you know, I'm lonely. I love all of these animals. I love all of these things, but... I don't think I could bed down with any of them. I'm not going to do it. I, I just, I, I, I said, what about me? And maybe he saw them in pairs. Maybe he realized they were already, uh, you know, hooking up. And uh, what are we going to do here? And so it's time for Adam to say, um, I, God, um, is this my life? Is this the way it's going to be? I don't think he was complaining. I think he was probably wondering. God knew it. He thought, this is not good for man. Man gets in trouble. And, you know, I read something uh, the other day that uh, the majority of the most violent people on earth who've done the most heinous crimes of, of, of mass murders or, or uh, serial killers and things like that, the majority of them were not married. It's interesting that a woman sort of creates a goodness and balances out a man's life in a way that is perfect. It's the way God made it. And so... I think it's important to remember that. And so Adam gave these names, and Adam was for Adam there was not found a helper comparable. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. So Genesis, the book of beginnings, origins, this is the first anesthesia, the first surgery, that is uh, mentioned. It's, it's also not a, a, a medical book, <laughs> but we have some um, a medical procedure taking place here. Interesting that he put him to sleep, and he took something from his side. It says rib. The word can certainly mean rib. It can also mean his side. So we're not sure. There is that, you know, that uh, folklore or tradition that a woman has one more rib than a guy does and it's not necessarily true it's not true it's not what it's about so we don't know if it was a rib if it was a bone or if it was simply dna if, if you read this he took of his rib closed up the flesh in its place then the rib 
which the Lord God had taken from man, the wording is important, He made into a woman and brought her to the man. The word made here is an interesting Hebrew word. It means to rebuild. Or, if you will, to restructure the DNA. With the 23 pairs of chromosomes, one of those pairs is different from the male versus the male. It's called the Y and the X, right? These are the different chromosomes. And I'm wondering, I'm just wondering, if that's all God did. He just changed those chromosomes just enough so that woman would be a different being, a different creature than what the man is. I would say a perfect match for the man, which is the idea here. And so they, God changed her X to a Y, and thus uh, we have woman. And so Adam said, this is now bone of my bones. So apparently he understood the procedure. She came from my bone. She's mine. She's flesh of my flesh. And Adam now is the source of all life. Once God gave him that life, it all began with Adam. Eve was there, of course. All of the lineage of humanity came through Eve. But Adam was the one who passed it on, and not by choice, of course. That is something that God did to her. And so, uh, did to him in order to produce her. Now this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Woman. Uh, some have said, and he saw her when God brought him to her, and and he said, whoa, man, that's, that's, whoa, that's sort of that kind of thing. You know, like he was stunned. I don't think that's what it was. Um, I, others have said that this is man's whoa. <laughs> it's uh, dependent on where you go with that, but uh, I don't think that was it either. But it was the compliment to man. She was the compliment to man. And it, it says he called her woman because she was taken out of man. The word man is Adam in Hebrew. It's the, the word is Adam. The word woman is Isha. Isha is uh, um, the Hebrew. Uh, it can mean woman. It can be, mean wife. It can mean any female. So it's a a generic word, and as many of the languages do the same. Verse 24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his Isha, his wife. And uh, uh, this is the institution of marriage. It's something that Jesus quotes this verse in Matthew 19. The Apostle Paul quotes this verse in Ephesians 5. So it is the institution of marriage that is here at the very beginning of creation. We have one man, one woman, and God hooks them up and says, I now pronounce you husband and wife. You are meant to live with each other forever. He is not condoning any other form of marriage. I know the world has a different idea, but Christians don't care what the world thinks. We just don't buy the world's thinking. We know that. They are off. We know they're off. We know that they are apart from God as we once were. And there is no end to the wicked imagination of mankind. But we as Christians must hold to God's view, God's word. Remember the threefold cord is not quickly broken. It's not easily broken. That is the union of marriage. One man, one woman, one God intertwined, remaining together in God's word and God's way. To unravel that is the destruction of the union. To try and change it, alter it, or dismantle the plan of God is to ruin the union altogether. And so uh, God has his way. He has his reasons. Obviously, the way it works is one man, one woman. That's how it works biologically. That's how it works in every other way. And so man is brought together. Therefore, a man is to leave his family, his mother, father and mother, 
and be joined, united, bound to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This term, one flesh, is understood in many different ways. The Apostle Paul seemed in 1 Corinthians 6 to refer to the one flesh as being a sexual union. And so sexually, they are definitely united. But it's more than that in, the, in a good marriage, in that it's emotionally united. We're one emotionally. We are also one, uh, I guess we could say, generationally in that we produce children from that oneness and, and that union, that, that physical union comes the production of children. And so children come into the scene and now they have the DNA of both mother and father. So there is a oneness there, strange sort of a thing, the way God created that. But especially, of course, there is the spiritual union because when a man leaves his father and mother and takes his wife and is joined to her, God blesses that. And the marriage bed now, according to Scripture, is not defiled. There's nothing, there's nothing unholy with that kind of a union. Every other kind of union is unholy. This is a holy union. God blesses it. This is what he is looking for. And so in God's eyes, this is marriage. He instituted it, therefore what man has joined together, let no man tear apart. Or, no, what God has joined together, let no man tear apart. What God has instituted, man has no right to tear apart. And so God has put together marriage. Man must keep his hands off of it and just do it his way. Or don't do it at all. And so what we see in our world today, of course, is the movement to undo the right definition of marriage. That's, of course, the height of audacity and sin and rebellion against God. The last verse, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. This is pre-sin. Pre-sin, they were naked, and it was innocent. So don't let any nudist colonies tell you <laughs> that they can handle that. Because they are as perverted and twisted as you can imagine because they're sinners like the rest of us. None of us, even in Christ, could handle the nakedness sort of a thing because of sin. So pre-fall, that comes in the next chapter, yes, innocence, that was there. There was nothing wrong with that then. It's wrong today. So keep your clothes on. Lord, bless this time we have together. We are so grateful again for the comfort and confidence of your word. No, There's no way we can understand it all. There's no way we can grasp it all. But we have the general concepts down. We understand that you've given us principles to live by, and if we will just obey them as best as we can and as, as clearly as we can understand it, and you will bless us. And that's what we look for. We love you. We love to please you, and that's how we want to live. So teach us your word so we can walk in it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.